Hello and welcome to Radio Collector, a production of the Electronics Museum of the Param Foundation. The foundation is dedicated to preserving the electronic history of Silicon Valley starting around 1895. We are currently building a new museum to tell the fascinating stories of people and their inventions that made Silicon Valley possible. Our new museum will be built as part of the San Jose Historical Museum. The new museum should be operational the latter part of 1995. We hope you will find time to come by and visit. I want to thank Mike Adams for his generous donation of his PBS series Radio Collector. I know as a home viewer you will enjoy his work. We would like you to join us and receive our newsletter. Thank you very much for watching. My name is Mike Adams, and I collect and restore old radios, radios from the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s. I do it as a hobby. It's an enjoyable hobby, and for a long time, I've wanted to do a series of television programs on collecting and restoring old radios. The rarest piece in my collection, this is a 1915 Kilborn and Clark. First, meet the people who collect old radios. Over the next five weeks, you'll watch dozens of collectors show hundreds of radios. Well, these are in great demand by collectors. They're called the breadboard, the uh, Atwater Kent breadboard. I learned that many collectors specialize in a particular era or brand of antique radio device. This is a, uh, the Horn Speaker Museum in uh, a room over my garage. It uh, represents a collection of radio horn speakers uh, from the 1922 to the 1927 era. You'll see powerful 12-tube radios in beautiful wood cabinets. 1938 radios, that's when Zenith made their best radios and they made the most radios. In other words, we were coming out of a depression and they knew that there was going to be a lot of radios sold and they really made some good radios. And rare 1930s Art Deco radios. Beauty! The final act of the And the beast. How are you, Mike? Glad to see you here. Later in this series, a stop at the Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters for a behind-the-scenes look at the golden age of radio. You'll spend time at a retail store that sells old radios and meet Jack Dempsey, the old radio collector. And I'll take you to a swap meet with the Southern California Antique Radio Society and talk with some longtime collectors. We didn't have big flea markets like this 20 years ago, but uh, there was a lot of activity, and the stuff was very reasonable. You could buy radios for $5, and you go to the dump and get them for 50 cents, but those days are gone now. Each week, a continuing look at restoration of radios made between 1928 and 1942. Bruce Westaby is our expert. And speaking to the point now, that is set on legs, you know, made prior to 1934, they stand about a 50% chance of being restored without taking from another set. Later, in this half hour, a brief look at the inventions that led to wireless communication in the early part of this century, 
and learn how radio became an important part of family life in the 1920s. But first, I want to find an old junk radio and start the restoration part of this series. You can still find these at the neighborhood thrift shops. Here's an RCA Victor Cathedral. Do you know how old it is or what, uh, what age it is? I think it's from the 1920s. Yeah. Uh, it's not working. It needs one part. Yeah, how much? Uh, get it going. I want about $75 for a pile. Yeah. The cord is all frayed up, so yeah, I wouldn't want it would be a good idea to plug it in now. Uh, that's amazing. Probably uh, they started using those tubes in the late 40s. Of well, this is a old outwater cam from a 1920s floor model. It's a metal cabinet. Uh, it's enameled. Does it work? Uh, it needs three tubes. It looks yeah. like a uh, 1949 Oldsmobile. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think a Studebaker. Studebaker, yeah. It's nice, and it's from the 40s, because you can tell by the type of tubes it uses. Does it work? I really have never plugged yeah. this one in. I don't know. I don't have any idea. Yeah. How much would you sell it for? I gotta get 25 for that. Yeah. Hmm. Really, really it probably works. Yeah, it probably works. Although I wanted something I could do woodwork on, and something I could. Do you have something that's totally beat up, like an old console that needs woodwork that doesn't work that has? Now how about this one back here, then? Can we dig this out here. Now let's take it outside. We can see it in the light. It's definitely a candidate for restoration, um, but it's all here, though. That's what I like about it. It's all here, and uh, we'll we'll consider this to be the before, okay, the before really shot. Cool. Yeah, a classic. Uh, yeah, we're going to put it in here. It's a classic uh, silver tone. Over the next few weeks, uh, you can follow the restoration of this 1930 Sears radio that I found uh, in a Hollywood junk shop. I will show you throughout the program the replacement of uh, some of these parts. And well, these are really in horrible shape. And by the end of the program, we will replace a lot of these capacitors and resistors and maybe a couple of tubes, and we'll have a working radio. But let us, first of all, take our cabinet, and you saw what it looked like when we found it there at the junk store. We'll, we'll take our cabinet to Bruce Westaby, a radio restoration expert. Stripping, and then the woodwork comes first. And then after that, uh, the set has to be sanded every square inch, or steel wool, whatever, whatever, however the set's made. And then the wood has to be prepared, and then the hand blacking done and then it gets spray tinted and then the clear put on. Part of the framework here that I can glue and, and put new, uh, what they call cross banding in here and, uh, and the veneer on it. This all had to come off, This, but this is wood. It's not, uh, oh, some of the things were like a pressed, a pressed Sirocco it was called. It oh was yeah, like, like plaster or? Very close. Yeah. And you have to take those off real careful or they shatter. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as the face goes, that's no problem. I brought a couple little ones uh, so you can see how it looks like. Uh, as far as the top goes, I can see the cross bending lifting al along the edge. So that's no problem. I take a hypodermic needle with a, some glue and glue along in there with a, or a butter knife and mm -hmm. clamp it down. And it needs to be re-veneered. Um, I can use strips of old veneer or I can buy veneer that you iron on. And the only thing is with iron-on veneer is that uh, uh, you just have to be real careful and make sure it's all nice and warm so that it won't bubble. Um, but generally it works real well. This is black walnut. This is black walnut. And this is like a, a regular walnut that you see quite a bit in most of the sets. And on the sides of the set, down towards the bottom, uh, this one's not bad at all, but a lot of times they have great big chunks out of them. Uh, where people have picked them up and then broken the chunks out. Mm -hmm. well, it's one thing I notice about, about restored sets is that the, the grill cloth always looks so new. It doesn't have that yellowed uh, cigarette smoked on kind of appearance that you expect. Uh, I don't know, how do you, what, what do you use for grill cloth? Because you can't buy it anymore like this, can you? This is no, no. Um, I use drapery material mm -hmm. and I'll look around until I find something that's suitable. And if it's too gold or too white, I take and tint it with a uh, with a spray sting. Oh, okay. And that mutes it down oh, a little bit and ma makes it look really nice. Because uh, nothing's worse than to get something all put together than have a grill cloth in there that with big chrome bars in it or something, you know? 
Our weekly restoration project is a late 20s electric radio in a wood cabinet, common from 1927 to the present. But radio doesn't start here. It begins 50 years earlier. It's the late 1800s, a world without radio, television, or talking pictures. Early electrical experimenters are trying to understand the sending and receiving of radio waves through space and without wires. Author and historian Morgan McMahon begins our story. It goes way back to 1865 to a gentleman named James Clerk Maxwell. He developed a theory of electromagnetic waves that predicted that one could propagate radio waves through space. His work laid a little dormant until 1887, when a gentleman named Heinrich Hertz first decided to test the theory. He sent electromagnetic waves, that is radio waves, across a room from a crude spark gap to a circle of wire that indeed had a small spark appear. Radio was not really harnessed until 1895, when a gentleman named Guglielmo Marconi transmitted radio messages. By 1899, he had set up commercial transmission from ships to shore, which was the major use of radio, or what it was called wireless in those days. The ship called the SS Republic was plowing through fog-covered waters off Nantucket Island uh, in the early uh, 1900s was rammed by another ship and began sinking. A gentleman named Jack Binns was the radio operator on that ship. He sent out what was called a CQD, a distress single, signal, which then was picked up by people on shore who dispatched ships to pick up the survivors. Only six people were lost in that accident and the world applauded the maturing of radio. Because of the early experimenters, the world was slowly learning to use wireless. In 1900, the primary commercial user of this new communications medium was the shipping industry. But early wireless was not radio broadcasting as we know it. It wasn't even called radio. Furthermore, it wasn't even the transmission of the human voice. That comes years later. Instead, wireless was the sending of Morse code dots and dashes, caused by turning a spark gap on and off with a telegraph key. My father was a pioneer in, uh, in radio. Uh, he was demonstrating wireless at the Nebraska State Fair in 1906. He had a, a spark transmitter and uh, he used a spark coil and the receiver was a glass tube in which were nickel and iron filings and as a radio signal would come through, the uh, filings would cohere, as they called it, and uh, change the resistance of the circuit and operate a relay and ring a bell. So that when you uh, pushed a button on one side of the room and sent a signal and uh, the bell rang on the other side of the room, you had actually been broadcasting by radio. In those days, they called it wireless. You can see that little spark there. This is an early transmitter. This was built in about 1915, um, that era. This is a coil, and uh, it made a spark across here. And you hooked an antenna onto it like you did the other. And then there was a, a, uh, a, a transfer switch here. You would transmit with this switch in the one position and throw the switch over to receive in the other. And uh, this part over here is a receiver. It consists of a coil of wire with two sliders on it. This is a fixed condenser. And then here it gives the crystal detector. This little piece of galena could be purchased at the lo local dime store for between 15 cents and maybe 25 cents if you wanted to get a real big piece of galena. And uh, you would wind a coil and tune the coil to the frequency of a broadcast station that was near you. and using headphones uh, and a, a long wire antenna. Usually you had to have 100 feet of wire outside and this would be connected to a water pipe ground. And then 
uh, you would sit down on a quiet evening and uh, turn this tap, which would uh, turn in more or less number of turns of wire, and then you would start to fiddle around with this little wire, which was called a cat whisker, and find a place on the Galena crystal where you could hear audio. To hear any radio signal, you need a detector, a device that changes high-frequency radio waves into audio. But how does the detector know which station the listener wants? As the number of transmitters multiplied, better methods of separating stations by frequency were needed. This is called tuning. There were a great many experimenters in the period, the early teens, and um, the most popular device at that time was a loose coupler. Stations, which might be received with a loose coupler such as this, were um, damp spark transmissions, so they had a wide bandwidth, and um, exact tuning wasn't very important because the uh, uh, selectivity of the circuit didn't have to be extremely sharp to um, receive the wide band signal such as a damp spark. The um, detectors used with these loose couplers, an experimenter might use a crystal detector or he might have used a vacuum tube detector if he had the money to afford one. Throughout the pre-World War I period, advances in coil winding meant better coils which improved both the sensitivity and selectivity of radio. World War I research was um, very active and uh, sets quickly became more sophisticated and um, actually a lot more electrically, mechanically complex. Still, radio as we know it had not yet happened. Yes, wireless had improved and was now used as a serious communication tool. Certainly, the sending and receiving of messages had come a long way since the turn of the century. Still, wireless communication was mostly spark or continuous wave sending of dots and dashes. And more people were sending and receiving messages over greater distances with greater reliability. Meanwhile, throughout the teens, a series of technical advances would finally allow quality transmission of voice and music. The real breakthrough that would put a radio in every home was right around the corner. The story of radio really hinges on the vacuum tube, first conceived by Thomas Edison, who found that one could emit electrons from a heated filament. A gentleman named J. Ambrose Fleming later developed what is called a vacuum tube diode. Uh, after this, of course, De Forest was really the one with the impact who came up with a tube called a triode in which you could make small signals big. This was the start of the real radio revolution. Slowly, in part due to its high cost, the vacuum tube replaced the crystal as a detector and made possible the amplification of earphone level signals to loudspeaker volumes. The tube made high quality voice transmission a reality. While experimenters labored to improve the tube, business people and their lawyers were battling out ownership issues. As late as 1921, the RCA tubes UV200 and 201 were the only legal tubes sold. These samples by DeForest, Sodion, Davin, Western Electric, and Arcturus were manufactured throughout the 1920s. The vacuum tube really brought voice transmission to the quality that one could use in broadcast. A gentleman named Dr. Frank Conrad in 1919 decided to set up a small transmitter in Pittsburgh. He was the start of true broadcasting, although people like Fessenden uh, actually broadcast earlier. The problem was there was no audience, no audience, no broadcast really. Radio arrives. With KDKA in Pittsburgh, the broadcasting era officially begins, and almost overnight, everyone will want to listen to radio for information and entertainment. When I was a young young kid, uh, uh, I used to build radios for the neighbors, 
And uh, this was way back in the uh, early 20s when radios first started. I used to build uh, one-tube radios and two- and three-tube radios and uh, crystal sets. And this was the common uh, thing that was done in the early, early days of, uh, of radio. Uh, people would make their own or they'd have somebody else make them for them. And uh, it was a challenge to get a radio that uh, all put together and get it to work and, and tune in all the distant stations and people would stay up real late at night. The neighborhood radio expert was pretty important, and almost every boy built a crystal set from a kit, perhaps for a Boy Scout merit badge. This is one of the first RCA uh, radiolas, and it's called a Radiola 2. And you had to use earphones with it because it wasn't powerful enough just being two tubes. So what they did later on, they, people wanted loudspeakers. So what they did was they made a little device called a a balanced amplifier, and that was that just connected to the little radio to three. Now we made a four tube radio out of it, and the radio would look like this. They were connected together, and you'd have four tubes, and you could run a loudspeaker with this. This is an Atwater Kent uh, breadboard radio. Atwater Kent sold component parts, pieces like this here, and the other d different types of parts that went on a board. Uh, he sold these things uh, to people that want to make their own radios. The uniqueness of it is this, that this is the only tuning you have. One tuning device and it just tunes the antenna. All of the rest of it over here is, is the radio frequency tubes, the detectors and the amplifiers. There's no tuning in this section of the radio like the ones that they were made later on, or even at, at the same time this was made, they did have radios that you could tune the different uh, uh, stages. But in this case, you only tuned one. So now, when this radio runs, you get a lot of stations all at one time, because you cannot separate them. It's not sensitive enough to separate stations. The typical household would have at least one radio, typically a, a, a three-dialer radio, which, by the way, was a very difficult thing to tune if you were far away from stations. Typically, the early radios required somebody who was very adept, uh, had almost a, a, a great deal of intuition, also had the guts to turn the thing on because very often, if you turn the filament voltage up a little too high, you would pop the tubes. By the way, a set of tubes for a uh, a radio would cost almost as much as, as half a week's labor would, would buy. As the tubes got better, then could take these three dials and just hitch the three dials together so that you would turn one knob and all three tuners inside the set would, would move. And uh, that then was, was the beginning of the simple sets. So we have really two basic kinds of sets that people use, the TRF set, which uh, was obsoleted Im immediately as RCA let other people build the superheterodyne sets. I remember as a youngster, uh, our first radio was a battery uh, set, had a uh, set of headphones, and we would, my dad would listen, and, and we kids would, he would turn one, one headphone out this way, and then our, our kids, where we kids, would, would stand around and listen to that one headphone while he heard the program in the other headphone. Yeah, it, it was a real ball, a great thing for pulling families together because you just all had all your heads put together in, in one spot. Then the, uh, the Baldwin headphone came out. It was, was a different construction than the... Uh, uh, than the other type headset, and it was actually louder. It, uh, it had a permanent magnet in here, and the, the uh, vibrations caused this little diaphragm to move back and forth, and that was attached to this diaphragm here. And it was so loud that you could, uh, you could put this headphone in a, uh, a bowl and uh, put it on the dining room table, and uh, the whole family could uh, sit around the table and listen to the radio. Uh, they were getting into the point, place where people d didn't want to sit around with earphones, they wanted to listen to things with loudspeakers. So they took this two-tube radio and they added another tube to it to make it so it was, you could run, run a loudspeaker and it's an amplifier. And they put it in the door, in the cover, in the back, where you, generally the batteries went in here. 
but to have it so they could run a speaker, they went ahead and added the third tube and put it in the door. And it has the same wiring. You can see the spaghetti here and up in here, which is it's identical to over here. And you notice it's got a GE uh, thing here and a GE transformer. And the tube is the same as the other tubes in there in the socket. So it's all General Electric parts, and they were just added to it to make a three-tube radio so you could listen to it with a loudspeaker. After Conrad's transmissions and KDKA, there was an explosion in the radio broadcast field. It was very difficult for the radio listeners because the radios operated from batteries. Before everybody had a battery charger, you had to take your storage battery down to the local garage and, and have it charged. And most people had two storage batteries. They had one that they would use, and then they had the other one that they would be down at the garage being charged. So that was a, a weekly chore for somebody to take the battery down and get it charged so you could run the radio the next week. These batteries, incidentally, are just a little outdated. They have a date of them, May 1926. In 1927, the true breakthrough occurred, and that was the development and production of alternating current radios that could plug right into the wall of the house. This really sprang radio loose. It also was the turning point in which radios changed from little scientific looking toys, uh, very strange things with, with three dials, almost like a, a three dial safe, to something which had easy use, uh, didn't have Sonny running down the street to get batteries charged, didn't have the continued expense of buying B batteries uh, every several weeks and also marked the turning point where one could really call radio a furniture and very elegant radio sets, the large consoles that we all remember, were made, built, produced by the millions. Here's what happened to the radio between 1925 and 1927, from storage battery to household electric power, from three dial tuning to single dial, earphones, to loudspeakers. In just a few years, the radio evolved from a two-way telegraphic communications device, an experimenter's hobby, into a family entertainment medium called broadcasting. And in a couple of weeks, I'll take you behind the scenes and let you see what a typical broadcast station looked like in the 1930s. Also in future weeks, the role of the amateur radio operator in the development of radio technology. Don Wallace was there at the beginning. As a boy in high school, I was interested in radio, of course, 1910, <coughs> and I became a high school student in 1912, and uh, of course the radio laws came in, and a neighbor Ham told me I ought to get a license, so I did. The uh, license was uh, nice and easy. He said, get a slip of paper and write, I can send and receive five words a minute. Take it down to my dad's bank and have it notarized. And uh, so I had the notary down there stamp it, mailed it in, that was my examination. Next week, I'll continue restoration on our $35 thrift shop radio, a 1929 Silvertone. Bruce Westaby will show us how he restores the chassis, the electronics of AC radios, and you'll meet three collectors of battery-era radio devices. That's the late teens to the late 1920s. All that and more next week on The Radio Collector. Looks like it's going to work. We still have these things around. This was the entertainment of, that people used way back before they had uh, widespread radios. This was the family entertainment.
I'm Mike Adams, and this is the second in a series of five programs on antique radio collection and restoration. Today, you'll meet three collectors of battery-era radio devices. That's the late teens through the late 1920s. You'll learn about the restoration of electric radios. These are called AC sets and were made from the late 1920s up until a time when the transistor took over. To a radio collector, there are two kinds of radios, electric and battery. And most long-time collectors have the older, more difficult-to-find battery sets made in the early 1920s. I consider myself a true-born collector. I was never satisfied to simply get one and look in it and become familiar with its insides. I was more interested in getting more of them. <laughs> really, I guess that I would say my uh, collecting in general began when I was as young as three or four years old. When, uh, I used to uh, try and acquire and promptly take apart and destroy uh, old uh, alarm clocks. And it didn't take too long to uh, run across my first radio that I was allowed to uh, dismantle. And uh, lo and behold, the radio was even more complicated inside. It had even more pieces. And uh, this was particularly interesting to me because in the case of the radio, you can't see what the pieces are doing. They're just sitting there quietly doing something. Okay. So I uh, quickly uh, uh, began a, a practice of uh, going door to door in my childhood neighborhood. I guess this was when I was six, seven years old or something, uh, asking people for old uh, radios they were going to discard. I then started to concentrate more on trying to get earlier radios. And in fact, I started to ride my bicycle to uh, the uh, Salvation Army and the local junk stores. and. Uh, anyway, at some point I did run across my first battery-operated receiver. And just to give you an idea of what some of these earlier ones look like, isn't that, isn't that beautiful? Quarter sawn oak, beautiful, like an instrument. This is a, a rather nice receiver. This is a Tusca, a one-tube regenerative receiver, a two-tube matching audio frequency amplifier and this was available by the way uh, in two separate cabinets and that was uh, that was kind of the philosophy for a long time is you would buy this to begin with radio is very expensive in these days and really kind of a new experimental toy for a lot of people so often they would start with this left hand which is what they needed to begin receiving broadcast signals and then they uh, when they decided they were sold on the concept they would buy the matching high power audio amplifier and improve the uh, their enjoyment of uh, radio reception. This is uh, an early transmitter, basically the same vintage as the rest of this equipment. Uh, to be precise, this is from about 1922. Uh, this is a 20-watt unit made by General Electric for Radio Corporation, RCA. And uh, it turns out, in collecting, that transmitters are much harder to find than the receivers, as I'm sure you can imagine. I mean, after all, how many transmitters do you have for so many receivers, typically? Sort of a not too well known brand. It's a clear tone, but what makes this interesting is it has a brass panel. That's solid brass. This is probably the, the rarest piece in my collection. This is a 1915 Kilborn and Clark. I still need to restore it, but uh, there were only Supposedly about 50 of these made over a three-year period, beginning in 1914 and ending in 1916. This happens to be the middle year model. And it's just a crystal set. These are mostly pre-1925 regenerative receivers. They were put together like today's hi-fi components with separate detector, tuner, and amplifier. Regeneration was an early 20s circuit technique used to increase the volume of a signal. It was complex to adjust and squealed a lot. Soon radio was made less complex. One dial tuning made a simple radio available to all. I think that most collectors uh, do at one point or, or another at least attempt to specialize somewhat in some particular aspect of the overall hobby. My specialties have never prevented me from also picking up anything outside that specialty that I found interesting when I saw it. But uh, again, I have 
gone through, I guess, three main specialties, Crosley, Radiola, and currently Radio Shop, which, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the true collector, uh, the, the kind of collector I, I like to think of myself as being, uh, and I think uh, I certainly know a lot that are like me, uh, really just like to look at uh, the thing they collect. And in fact, it makes them feel very good just to sit and uh, take it all in, so to speak. I, I many times come back here and uh, just sit and sort of meditate, I guess is as good a word as any, on uh, all these all these radios. And I love the way they look, and uh, I like uh, very much what they represent. I am an electronic engineer by uh, profession, and uh, nowadays it's very something very refreshing about uh, looking at something as simple and primitive uh, as these radios are compared to the things I have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. Even though that tube is almost all the way down into replace, it will still work because the tube actually does still function even though it's very, very weak. And, well, it should. It's from a radio made in 1930, and this tube was replaced, um, as it says on here, back in uh, 1941. So this radio has had a lot of service in its life. I have a feeling, just looking at the components. To learn how a radio is supposed to work, I always write down the model number and take it to the downtown library. Here, I can Xerox the manufacturer's service information found in the writer repair manuals. So if you want to look through here and fill out a call slip, and we'll get it from the stacks for you. So many radios. This is model 14. This is a very, very old one. Um, 1150, we'll call this one. Um, 1150, which is volume 2. So I need uh, writer manuals, volume 2. The Los Angeles Public Library is one of the few libraries in the Southland that carry this writer series. This is the Perpetual Troubleshooters Manual, and this provides schematic diagrams of radios from the 1920s to the 1940s. We also have the SAMS Photofax series that covers schematic diagrams from the 1940s to the present day. Okay. Hmm, that's interesting. That's good. That's exactly the right one. Mm. That's exactly right. Oh, this is excellent. This is exactly what we need. Uh, not only do we have a schematic diagram, which uh, in the electronic world uh, uses certain symbols to designate components in a radio or television, but also Sears um, engineer, the person who designed this back in 1929, actually gives us a pictorial diagram, which essentially is a line drawing of the actual tube sockets, coils, transformers, all the capacitors and resistors. So this is, this is very, very useful service information. And um, also, they have included a page which uh, gives us all the voltage readings. So when I'm fixing this radio, I will be able to use my multi-tester to uh, make sure the radio is working exactly like it um, intended. Last week, I found this 1929 Silvertone console radio in a thrift shop. This is the chassis, the tubes, transformers, capacitors, and resistors. It's our weekly restoration project. I've tested all the tubes. I like to use old test equipment, like this signal generator and tracer. But you don't need these to restore a radio. All you really need is experience, the right books, and a simple voltmeter. Once you learn about repair, you'll know that the most important restoration task is replacement of capacitors. I'll definitely replace the filters in the power supply section because uh, filter capacitors always go bad. Normally, I don't test the small paper coupling capacitors if the radio is over 30 years old. I just automatically replace them. They usually cost less than 50 cents a piece a good investment if you play your radios often. While I may repair a half dozen radios a year as a hobby, Bruce Westaby does this every day. I asked Bruce about chassis restoration. Okay, well the first thing 
that a person has to do when you start in to re repair a set is to look and see that there's no burn parts or physical damage that makes it a set not restorable. In other words, if the power transformer is fried, or you look underneath here and there's always a resistance network if that's not cooked, and there's a B-plus resistance network if that's uh, not uh, opened up. A lot of times, too, on the older sets, this tuner in here, this one is, this one looks like it is, on the Majestics, and this is an Ever Ready, and some of the other ones, they're all pot metal. Oh, and the early Zeniths were pot metal, too. And if the set has been outside in the weather, and for some reason you can't turn it, it's best to look inside, because once these all shatter, there's no way that they can be replaced. So, and it's getting to the point now that a set on legs, you know, made prior to 1934, they stand about a 50% chance of being restored without taking from another set. One thing very important is that if a person finds a radio, don't plug it in. I'd say 95% of the time, if a person finds it in a second-hand store, or an antique store, or especially in a barn or somewhere, don't plug it in because uh, these filters deteriorate with age through just sitting. And what they'll do is the set will come on and, you know, maybe get a station and then it'll start to hum louder and then louder and these things will get hot internally. And once those get to start to shorten, they get really, really hot, the power tube turns red hot. And then if that doesn't burn out, if it burns out, that's great. But if they don't burn out, then it cooks the power transformer. I have people call me all the time and say, well, I think it's a bad tube. Well, tubes are like little sealed units, and they don't go bad that often. Power tubes will burn out because of an overload, and output tubes will get flat because they've been overloaded. Uh, as for burnout tubes and these older sets, I come across maybe one or two a year. The parts that are almost impossible to replace are like these faces here, because all these, uh, the inks are water soluble. So in other words, a person gets one of these, like this has had a little mold on it and, and lots of dirt. Um, take a little 409 and, and, and squirt on that, and, uh, or, or Windex or any detergent, uh, and the numerals will just run, run right off. And that includes this along with uh, Philco and 90% of, of, of the other sets. So the only and best way to clean a face is to take some, a piece of terry that's not even damp and just buff it. And then just, just same thing, same goes with all these numbered faces. Generally, the stuff, real early stuff, maybe between 25 and 26, is really difficult to repair because they made them not to be repaired. You have to chisel the parts out, you have to drill the parts out. <clears throat> the sets maybe between 29 and about, I mean 27 and about 30, all were real good, real good quality. And I can generally restore most of them. And then it seems like about 30 to 31, there were still sets a lot of good quality, but some of them were starting to get a little bit cheaper. And then it seems like in 32 to about 34, um, they stayed with a two and a half volt filament, but they went to a different tube, a 57, 58, and stuff like that. And then it seems to be about 34, that's when the first six volt filament line started up. That started to get real good quality about then. Zenith come out with some real good sets. Uh, Philco had some good sets. RCA, all the main brands were really good sets. Prior to the Depression, there was like 175 different radio manufacturers, and then up in the late 30s, there got down to about be about 16. And there were a lot of little orphan brands, and a lot of little, what I mean by orphan brand is that uh, some guy set up a thing in a garage, and somebody sent away for the cabinet, and he sent away for the tubes, and he sent away for the chassis, and then the speaker, and, and they put it all together and didn't have a name on it. Average time on any one of my consoles I complete is about 25 hours. And everything is, like I say, everything's perfect. Uh, I've seen things that have been done in, oh, it must take all two hours. You know, it gets three parts in the bottom and a can of varnish poured over the top and some brushes slapped on it and, uh, uh, and somebody slacks for a spear cloth and out it goes, you know. Um, that's, that's not restoring.
When people ask me how to tell the age of radios, one way, of course, that I know is by looking at the types of tubes, and that, to me, is about the best way of telling when a radio was made, sometimes serial numbers or model numbers. But one rule of thumb is with 30 radios and their lighted dials. For example, all of the early 1930s radios had these very small window dials. This is middle 30s, the big round dial. The late 30s and on into the 80s actually brought this more conventional type of radio dial, a rectangular or sometimes known as a slide rule dial. So this is late 30s on, middle 30s, the round dial and the small window dial from the early 1930s. Just one way of telling the age of radios from the 1930s. This is a, uh, the Horn Speaker Museum. It uh, represents a collection of radio horn speakers uh, from the 1922 to the 1927 era. And there are approximately 121 speakers here. In the beginning, in the late uh, 1800s and very early 1900s, earphones were the typical listening device for people listening to audio. As radio developed in the late 1915, 16 era, uh, the Magnavox people, through uh, two inventors, Jensen and Pridham, uh, accidentally put a driver into a phonograph bell, and uh, lo and behold, they got amplification. Okay? Uh, a Magnavox horn speaker behind me, which is one of their early models, uh, shows their styling and technique that, that developed from a gooseneck uh, kind of design. And uh, this became pretty much a standard on the market in the early 20s as radio was developing. Made with a variety of materials in many sizes and shapes, horns were a large air column coupled to an earphone-type transducer. They took advantage of the increased volume of the vacuum tube amplifier. You're looking at a, a, a cone speaker with uh, cone material made out of linen, and it's drawn, and it's been impregnated with something that has become rather stiff, firm, and uh, hand-painted by the factory artists. The cone speaker used a large paper diaphragm moving in free air. It's like today's loudspeaker. The longest horn in my collection, it's uh, seven feet, give or take a few inches, if it were stretched out linearly. It was made for a uh, console cabinet, and uh, it's dull black. Some people call it ugly. Uh, tone quality is not too bad compared to my other horn speakers. Floyd Paul is a nationally known expert and wrote the book on horn speakers. In this little booklet, which is the only one of its kind, there are identified some 600 models and some 300 manufacturers of horn speakers in the 1922 through the 1927 era. 1927 cone speakers, magnetic cone speakers, became popular and by 1927-28 horn speakers were pretty much out for uh, new sales. Magnetic speakers stayed a year or two and dynamic speakers replaced them in turn in the 1928-29 period. What happened, I think, on this grill, somebody really crunched it a good one, because this was like it was twisted up in here. It was like it bent, broke in that way. So, uh, and it's all glued in real nice and tight now. So, and I put just a little piece of, little tiny piece of filler in right here. And once that, that'll take the, that'll take the stain, and, and once it's sanded, you won't hardly be able to see that. And, I, and if it does show, I can always take and, uh, uh, stipple it in with a little stain or something. How do you strip it? It's it's what's called a uh, uh, it's like a lacquer thinner base stripper. It's real mellow. It's not caustic. Mm -hmm. If you use those real caustic heavy nasty strippers where it goes on it's like jelly. They're too yeah. caustic. They're hard on your hands mm -hmm. and just splash in your face. It's really rough and uh, and then it takes too many fillers out of the wood it just makes us it would make a set like this is just as dry as a tater chip you know just just terrible now this is two halves can we help you with this yeah okay. with uh off and off of an, uh, a set that i broke up but they do come out 
handy to clamp things. Oh, I see. Our little tops inside here. Oh, yeah. I get it. Okay. All right. right. Now, this, this is why I'm, I'm here because I have never ever done woodwork successfully. I tried uh, making a coffee table once. I made it out of white pine, mm -hmm. and it was so it was so um, fragile that when you set a cup down on it, it dented it. I mean, it was, <laughs> Yeah, pine embarrassing. Is, it was so embarrassing. Yeah, pine uh, is soft. I knew I had to do something else. Yeah, pine was terrible. Uh, but, you know, with what I do now, it's just after your years of trying and failing, you know, so... Whoops, clunk. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, well, I, we should have had it okay. laid down at an angle. Okay. Now... I don't think it hurt it. No. Ah, uh, good. It's doing... Uh, okay. Yeah, it's doing fine. Okay. So, you, in other words, you do a half at a time, is what you're saying. Well, I had I had started out with one big piece, mm -hmm. and when I soaked the uh, the cross banding off this piece, it automatically split in two. Oh, and this had no this had no veneer when we got this right. No, and it was oh. loose all the way around here, okay. so I took it and it's all been glued. Now, is this used veneer from another old radio cabinet? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. In other words, you, you you find old radio cabinets that aren't that are, that are good for veneer. Yeah, that's amazing. I started in electronic business as a kid, in electronics and uh, radio amateur and so forth. And uh, I used to didn't have any money for parts, so one of the things places I used to go was a city dump, and this was back after World War II. And used to find a lot of the old stuff, and then I wanted the new things. But uh, as time went on, I thought, well, maybe I better save some of this, you know, maybe save one of them. So I did save one of these old sets, and. Uh, but quite a few years went on before I really got serious about it, and in the mid-60s I thought, well, I wonder what's around. So I started going out and seeing what I could find, and uh, this is what happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's about 130 radios plus a bunch of amplifiers and telegraph and sounders and uh, test equipment, and uh, so it's pretty full of uh, electronics, mostly from the mid-20s on back. This is the one that probably got me started. This I found in the city dump probably about 1948. It's a beautiful set. It's a RCA, Super Heterodyne, portable. It's a model radio of 26. This is an early RCA two-tube uh, uh, receiver. This is about 1923. Here's a uh, early crystal set. RCA's uh, Radiola 1, it's called. These are in great demand by collectors. They're called the breadboard, the uh, Atwater Kent breadboard. They were sold this way with uh, exposed parts. And there's three different models here, the 10, the 10B, and the 12, which is the biggest one. A lot of these are beautifully made. Inside, the wires are all nice and square cut. Parts were nicely made. The reason these were exposed, you saw all the parts on them. Most of the radios, you can open the lids and look inside and see the tubes lit. A lot of times the tubes were exposed. That way you could see how bright the filaments were, or if, if they were even lit. They said they made them vertical so that on a crowded ship you'd, you wouldn't take up as much of your, uh, your table space <laughs> with a, a larger uh, flat key. I don't know with, with what is with other people. To me, to, to, to look inside of a well-built set, love some of these sets inside are beautifully built. The coils are all nicely wound in layers, and. Everything was, attention to detail was, was really great. And uh, to me, that's beautiful. I, I think uh, <laughs> the workmanship that went into some of these sets uh, is uh, what makes them attractive. What is the current state of radio collecting? I asked the experts who collects, what do they collect, and why? The radio collecting community is a very diverse set of people. There are technologists you like to work with, with equipment, with soldering irons. Uh, it, it really is a thing a technologist can enjoy. Uh, there are a great many people who like the sets because they're nice pieces of furniture. I consider uh, radios to be like objects of art. And just as art itself is a uh, very individualized uh, uh, Thing. I mean, some people like modern art, and some people like, uh, you know, the Renaissance period and all this sort of thing. Uh, uh, some people like uh, ornate wood cabinets and uh, many, many tubes and chrome chassis or whatever, and others happen to prefer uh, 
the very primitive and uh, instrument-like qualities of a battery-operated radio. A few years ago, uh, collectors seemed to want wireless equipment. Uh, when I got into this seriously, some eight, nine years ago, uh, there was a strong tendency for the 1920s, the battery radios, to be collectible. As, uh, uh, as I have noted the last three or four years, uh, radios in the 30s, the early AC radios, the cathedrals, the table models, consoles, uh, before World War II are becoming very collectible. More people are collecting, people that are not are really... Uh radio people, people that are collectors that want to decorate their home. So everybody that wants a 1930s home wants a cathedral radio. Through the 60s into the 70s, people would, uh, would look at someone who collected uh, AC sets as, as, as some kind of an upstart. It's not really until we moved into the latter 70s and the 80s that, that the collection of, of the AC broadcast sets uh, became legitimate, if you will. As a result of doing this series, in a way, as a result of my search for the radio collectors among us, I met people that collect microphones, vacuum tubes, books, pictures, all types of radio devices from the early 1900s through the 1950s. Now, when I was a kid in the late 1940s, I used to hang around the radio repair shops and pester the service people, and I've been working with electronic devices for a long time, but if you are a newcomer to the hobby, let me show you something about AC radios. This is a power supply of a typical AC radio. This is the power transformer. This is the rectifier tube, and these are the filter capacitors. Now, it is entirely possible that when plugged in, a voltage of six to 700 volts AC could appear across the plates of the rectifier too. You need to know what you're doing. My advice is to take a community college class in basic electronics or go to a public library and read about electronics before you attempt any serious under chassis restoration. Next week on our program, you'll meet collectors of mid-1930s through World War II big cabinet radios. Bruce Westaby will tell us all about cabinet restoration and go to the Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters for a behind-the-scenes look at the golden age of radio programming. I'm Mike Adams, and I want to welcome you to the third in a series of five half-hour programs devoted to the restoration and collection of antique radios. Today, you'll meet some collectors of 1930s through early 1940s big cabinet radios, like this one. Bruce Westaby will show us how he restores the cabinets of these radios, and I'll take you to Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters for a behind-the-scenes look at the golden age of radio. Secretary of State Charles Evans Hughes defended the Harding administration course on the League of Nations today when asked whether it wasn't time for the Republican Party to give the people an unequivocal statement in regard to its position on the world court. Early radio could hardly be called broadcasting. First as a curiosity, then as a two-way communications tool, radio finally made its way into the home in the 1920s. In this half hour, meet some of the creative people that were a part of the golden age of radio broadcasting. Tell me, Mr. Moody, what are your feelings about the radio? I don't hold with furniture that talks. Well, you, you have a radio. No, I had one in the hen house. Yeah? One day, all the hen's nest would be empty. Uh-huh. Next day, every nest would have two eggs into it. You mean 
hens was listening to double or nothing. Yeah. <laughs> that period of radio, like from the mid-30s to the mid-50s, was a very important part of American history, and it mustn't be forgotten. So we have tried to save all the memorabilia. The, we have thousands and thousands of uh, transcriptions and tapes of early radio shows, and our members, we have a, over 800 people who have been at least 20 years, most of us more like 40 and 50 years in the business, and we've tried to gather all these things up so they won't be destroyed. Gotta hurry and pack. We'll travel light. It's the thing to do these days. Where are the suitcase? Right here in the hall of closet. Here's uh, Fibber McGee. Now, Jim Jordan is the chairman of our board. You know he was Fibber McGee. He followed Edgar Bergen, who was our first chairman of the board. And Charlie McCarthy went along with him. I was in Chicago in uh, the golden days. I was there from 37 to 40. I was on uh, uh, Against the Storm, and I was an understudy for Ma Perkins. I would have left town if she, Virginia had ever gotten sick because I knew I couldn't sustain that beautiful performance that Virginia Payne did on Ma Perkins. I was on Bachelor's Children and Midstream and countless shows, Lights Out. And then I went to New York and I worked on Against the Storm and many others. Well, Doctor, maybe you found out what's wrong with my husband. Maybe you can tell me about him. All those other doctors. Uh, Gertrude, that's yeah. well. I liked your, uh, your entry line. It was flat and it's good characterization. Now, I want to get two emotions in this last uh, speech of yours. And also on the other line in that, in that little sentence there, make sure that I have the feeling that you are concerned about your husband's health. I was an actor during the golden days of radio. I think the 30s and 40s, those were the years when radio was the best. Uh, in those days, people listened to programs. They, they tuned in at certain times as families or as individuals, mostly as families. So radio was our companion. It was important to us. I was asked to produce a little sample radio show. And uh, in it, we had to use some of the techniques the dramatic techniques and the physical techniques that radio drama called for. Very good radio drama. Let's look at it, this little drama, which we called simply Sam, which is the name of the main character. Things are a lot different now, I guess. Now that Lillian and me are well, sort of engaged. But it was awful important when it was happening. You know, like a lot of things that happen. And it wasn't so long ago, either. I was still working part-time for old Craig in the Craig drugstore. It was after closing hours in the store on Saturday evening. Lillian, Craig's daughter, left an hour or so before, after helping me clean up. I was just locking the front door when I heard the register up front. Hey! Hey, what are you doing with that box? Get out! I, I, I thought that... Lillian! I thought the store was closed, Sam. I, I didn't see any light. I... In the writing, uh, we used a narrator in this radio show to tell the story, sort of fix it, and then to hear his thoughts. It was the sort of thing you just don't expect from a girl. I didn't know what to say or do. It was her father's door, of course, but... Well, old Craig wasn't the kind of guy to let Lillian out after 9 o'clock, much less let her take any money out of the till. I didn't know what to do. She was crying awful. Please, Sam, please don't let Father know about it. Oh, gee, Lillian, I'm not going to tell him. After all, nothing's been taken or anything. That's just it, Sam. I've got to have $7. I just got to. I lost the money for the class dance. Father won't be until Monday, Sam. I'll, I'll have it back by then. I promise. I just got to have it, Sam. I just got to. We could accentuate a dramatic... A uh, section with a musical stinger or a bridge. I didn't know what to do or say, but she was all kind of breathless and sobbing and pretty. I guess I've been stuck on her for a long time. After all, it partly was her money, wasn't it? She was right about her father not coming down till Monday, and well, that was the first part of it. 
It all would have been all right, too, if old Craig hadn't left his cane in the store that weekend. Because the next day, Sunday... Amen. And keep the words of the Almighty close to your hearts, my brethren. Stop nudging me, Lena. What do you want? You'll have to walk home alone after services, Penny. Why? I've got to drop by the store, Penny. I left my stick there last night. Mind you, hurry home or you'll get a cold lunch. As you would have them do unto you is a cardinal rule for all of us. Amen. Yes, Father. Your father wants you to stop wearing tracks on the floor. Exactly. Why don't you sit down and read, Sam? Haven't you any homework? I've, I've finished it, Father. Now, who can that be? I'll get it. I could see who it was through the window, and my stomach kind of bounced a little. He was awful mad. His face was that flushed color. I went into the kitchen too scared to face him, I guess. But I could hear what he was saying to Father through the door. Your son is a thief, Mr. Johnson. That's quite an accusation, Mr. Craig. Anyone with your anarchistic ideas, Johnson, ought to keep his son under... He was pretty wild. Father was calm, but then he started getting mad. After Craig left, Father called me into the living room. I thought to myself, I gotta keep her out of this, I gotta. There was only one thing to say to Father. I did it, that's all, I did it. <laughs> It wasn't any use trying to keep up the lie any longer. I guess I kind of broke down and told them all about it. All about how she was crying and how she was class treasurer and, and how she needed the... Seven dollars, eh, son? What kind of coins was a class treasury in? Oh, it was mostly quarters and dimes. Hmm. Do you suppose, son, if Lillian got that money back, she'd have the courage to face her father? Oh, sure she would, Pa. It's just that she got real Never scared. Never mind, son. Martha, hand me your pin money jar. Okay, that's the last capacitor I've replaced in the Sears Model 41. These are some of the old capacitors that I took out. These are old paper capacitors. They only last about 25 years, and then the uh, sometimes the wax uh, comes out of the end, or the, the dielectric, the insulation between the two connectors shorts out, and you get a bad capacitor. A capacitor is supposed to block DC voltage and allow AC voltage to pass through. AC is the signal path and the DC is the high voltage. And when these break down, you, you get no radio. So what I've essentially accomplished in this silver tone radio is to replace all of these old paper capacitors with these modern ceramic types and these will easily last another 25 or 30 years. You can often estimate the age of a radio by looking at the tubes. From the late 20s through the middle 30s, tube bases had four, five, or six pins. In the middle 30s, tubes with eight pins and a plastic center key appeared, some with metal covers over the glass. And from World War II into the 50s, a smaller tube with seven or nine pins in a glass base slowly replaced the larger sizes. The main thing is in buying a set is, is that if, if this little escutcheon here is missing, or the face and back of that's broken with the numbers and stuff like that. Mm. It it uh, nine times out of ten you have to scrap another set to make that one uh, complete, unless you get real lucky and find just a chassis somewhere with sure. a face on. Uh, and and that's getting harder and harder to do because there's more and more people becoming interested in it and they're buying anything and everything. And so sure. so it gets to the point where you have to horse trade a little bit here and there. And yeah. Well, one thing I was looking for when we were going through the thrift shops, uh, and I still look for, is a radio that has cosmetic, most of the cosmetic features uh, there, like, such as the dial and the uh, escutcheon plate. Knobs I know I can get, grill cloth I know I can do, but, but as far as the actual dial, that's something when, when it lights up, ye that yellowed plastic over the years, there's nothing you can do to reproduce that. I mean, no. In my opinion, I've never seen anything that looks quite like an original dial. No, once that's broken or gone, it's, it's real difficult. Well, okay, this is beautiful, and um, 
uh, what I want to do is come back in a couple of weeks and um, should I bring the radio with me and we'll put it back together and um, sure, try yeah. it out and we'll, we'll make that our, our final stop here and uh, that'll be the end of our series. But Uh, had anything to do with the show as far as engineering is concerned and uh, we would uh, set up the orchestra and uh, the, the studio of course would be uh, through the control room window and uh, work with the director the director would usually sit right to the left of the uh, engineer and he would have a talkback microphone similar to the microphone that we have here and then uh, there would be an assistant director usually from uh, um, the network, if it was a network show, the assistant director would be over there and then a script girl uh, down on the end. So there would be about four people in the control room. This is the 44BX, which was the, the standard of the broadcast business all through the golden uh, days of radio. Here is the inside of a, of a ribbon microphone. Uh, if you'll notice the ribbon here uh, is suspended between two pole pieces. These are horseshoe magnets and uh, uh, the ribbon is suspended in here and a voltage is developed as it, as, the, as it vibrates. As I move my hand, just the air pressure moves the ribbon. The first radio microphone was made from telephone parts. It was replaced in the mid-twenties by several versions of carbon button and the more rugged dynamic types. And along with the ribbon mic in the studio, the condenser mic with its built-in three-tube amplifier was used for live music. Some radio programs were recorded on large discs called electrical transcriptions, but most were done live, sometimes with hilarious results. There were a couple of us playing leads, and we were at the microphone, and I was the heavy, the villain. And I had to say something like, uh, okay, uh, you dirty so-and-so, uh, take that. And then a shot was supposed to ring out. Well, I, I did the line, take that, nothing. And I looked over at the sound, the sound effects man, Advance, and he just went like this. <laughs> Something happened, I guess, to the, to the record. He had a sound effects record. And so uh, I was a quick thinker, you know, at the microphone, and I turned around, and the, the other actor was Jack Wilson, and I said to Jack, uh, well, you must have jammed my gun. You got to it early. You know, that was a line I ad-libbed. Director was, you know, in the booth just going hog wild, <laughs> making all kinds of crazy faces. And I said, uh, well, you must have jammed my gun. I said, well, I got it fixed now. Take that. Again, nothing. This time, Vance held up the head of the phonograph and arm. It had come off. <laughs> He was holding it up, and he was very gleeful. We're talking about a live show, you understand. We were on the air. It wasn't a network show. It was a local show. And uh, uh, here I was having to do something, and I thought very quickly again. I said, okay. I said, I'll kick you to death. And I, <laughs> sorry, that's the story. And the director, of course, was convulsed. And uh, Jack, the other actor, Jack Wilson, dropped his script. It went all over the floor. I don't know how we finished it. Somehow we got through it. <laughs> the years 1930 to 1950 were the true heyday of radio entertainment because of the technology that allowed people to have radios in every home and then radios uh, in every room of the home. The radio was the first truly phenomenally new piece of furniture and people really that wanted first class furniture would 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 pay three thousand dollars for instance for a, for a, a zenith chinese model radio uh, in the days when a new automobile cost four hundred dollars <laughs> Without a mind. Nice radio. 
This is a 1936 Grunau teledial made by General Household Utilities in Chicago. The idea of this radio was that you could dial it like a telephone. Your favorite station, for example, uh, say you wanted uh, KECA, which is now uh, KABC. Put your finger in here and you mechanically move this until it stops at 79 and it locks right into the, the station. Here's a all the 29 Zenith, that's, that's uh, it's really a pretty set. It's got the tuner inside there, the speaker inside there, and inside here is push buttons. And these are the first push buttons because they're mechanical. And when you push them down, it runs the tuner around. Very, very primitive. And But the set is mint, and it doesn't play, but uh, uh, it soon will with uh, no problems. Yeah. But finding something that's in good original condition is uh, getting harder and harder. Uh, that's where fellow collectors come in, and that's where different leads as to who might have an estate sale or who's been collecting stuff over the years that may may part with something. Uh, this is a 36 AK, which is one of the last sets they built because they went out of business in 36. And this flops down like so, and inside is a uh, it's God's clock, and these little cords pull out like so and they plug in for your different times and what that does is that uh, the set will come on by itself motor tune to the station you want play that program for your hour and then go to another station and they'll do that as many times as there is cords and then shut off by itself Hi. We have a few here. I didn't buy these. My brother bought these. I don't particularly... They're old consoles, but the only thing... Open the door on the... No, put it on the floor. Open the door on the console there. The reason why I don't buy consoles is because they take up too much room. Maybe somewhere along the way I will go into it. But he, he bought a few consoles. I don't particularly like them because only because of space. They take up so much space. It just happened someone came around and asked me if I was interested in old radios. The first time around, I said no. Then the more I thought of it, the more I realized I'm in the Hollywood area, which to me would be more of the radio beginning. And for that reason, I thought it might not have been a bad idea. So the next time the fellow came around, I told him, yes, I was definitely interested in old radios. My intention is someday to actually have a small museum of radios. Well, and, and well informed, each one well marked, the vintage, the year, the the, the manufacture, the model, and all that. I will have that eventually. That is my ultimate goal. Frankie Lane, one of his big hits. Francisco, a trophy. Midas is the number. Okay, all of our numbers. This is a mid-30s uh, radio, a McMurdo Silver. This is a really expensive radio. This is a radio that cost maybe $1,000 back during a time when cars didn't even cost that much. This radio has chrome chassis, 24 tubes, one of the nicest radios you could buy uh, during the Depression, incidentally. Even through the Depression, there were people who either still had wealth or wanted to give the appearance of wealth. Uh, the It was a little bit of, of the... Uh, conspicuous consumption phenomenon in, in that people who really wanted good furniture were willing to take their relatively limited funds during the Depression even uh, and sock it into a, a, an elegant radio set. If the radio set had become the, the first new true piece of living room furniture in 500 years, I suppose. This is the 37 GE, the one we had on the bench. And this whole cabinet was apart. The top was off, this piece was out, the sides were out. Uh, I bought it from a friend of mine, I bought it reasonable. And the reason is, is because uh, these sides along here were all split out. And they're along the edge, they were all split out. And this is a real nice Crosley. This is all burl across here. And this cabinet is a cheaper cabinet where it's not 
uh, screwed together. It's nailed and glued. And so a lot of the Majestics are that way, and a lot of the Crosleys are that way, and then some of the cheaper sets like that Grinnell. And when you try to get them apart, they break. In other words, you get in there with a butter knife or a wood chisel and you try to pop them apart, it splits. So a lot of times, uh, uh, I, out of necessity, these have to, stay, have, to have to stay together. I can take a top off, uh, you know, to, to help sanding and stuff like that. But sometimes when I get done with a set like this, it may be not as clean as some of the other things. But, you know, because you have a hard time getting all the little uh, sanding particles and other particles out of the little cracks and stuff. I scrap a lot of sets and I take the veneer off the, off the sets. Uh, generally to get the veneer off, uh, soak it in like a big cookie tin for one day and it'll generally come, uh, peel right off with the help of a putty scraper. Then that way you can really get some really nice looking uh, veneers. This is black walnut and this is a quilted walnut. And this is a, this is a Crosley table model here. Now the set is basically a really good design as far as the cabinet goes, but the only good wood in the whole cabinet is this piece of uh, quilted, uh, quilted uh, walnut right here. All the rest of it is just uh, orange crate wood. I mean, it's just a ply. Okay, well, as far as, as, far as uh, uh, gluing on like the main joints and stuff like that, I use this alphabetic resin glue. It seems, seems to do pretty well. But on veneering, I use this liquid high glue, which is real, real close, close, or the original stuff that they used originally. And like I had to put in a piece around here on this, this is a 39 filco. This is about the midsection out of it. Uh, this is hard to do without on a curve like this without ending up with lots of little pieces. Uh, but with but when you use the high glue, in between the joints you can see it's just a little tiny black line. Where if you use the um, half thick resin glue, if it doesn't butt just perfect, perfect, uh, it'll leave a white line when the set is done. Well, to do a set right, it has to be pulled apart and everything taken care of as far as the speaker grills and, and, and any splits that are in it. Uh, otherwise, later on down the line, somebody will move it and it's going to come apart you know, or not look good. You know? And the woods are generally too pretty to, to let go with uh, just a crummy finish on them. You know? So now the top broke out of the nose, yep. And uh, the past the top is lining the wind looking down. It burst into the Get it started, get it started. It's crazy, and it's crazy. It's crazy, it's terrible. I am elected president of the United States. As I looked at this Scott radio, and this is really the way this radio was kept with the beautiful chrome uh, covers for the tubes. That was a very high class radio. But I think of how important radio was to the nation, particularly during World War II, when news was so vital to us, and it bound the nation together. And that's the news picture as it looks in post-war Europe tonight. Confused enough to be sure, but certainly not altogether hopeless. Good night. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. I think that radio can be credited for, as I say, binding the nation together to make everyone determined to win World War II. And we would listen so carefully uh, to Edward R. Murrow coming from uh, This Is London, as he would come on and describe the bombings over there before we got into it. And then we would listen every night to all of our various newscasters, and it was extremely important. And the comedy shows, like our dear Faber McGee's program, it gave us cheer, and it made us happy to have something to laugh at, because they were very sad times in World War II. But radio was there, and it kept us together.
Well, from Hollywood, we tried to give you some nice historical insights into radio programming the way it used to be, because after all, if uh, you're a radio collector or you like to restore old radios, it's nice to know the type of radio programming that uh, one would listen to on an old radio. Next week on this program, we're going to spend our time with Jack Dempsey, the old radio collector, a man who has a retail store in Hermosa Beach, and we'll tell you where you can find a radio, and we'll visit a couple of swap meets, too, and maybe buy some old radios. So come back next week. This has been Mike Adams. Thank you. That whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. And you'll want to watch Radio Collector in two weeks as we go to the 10th anniversary convention of Spurdvac, the Society for the Preservation and Encouragement of Radio Drama, Variety, and Comedy. I am the Whistler. And years before that first radio drama, The Amateur Radio Operator. First organized in 1909, hams contributed to radio's invention and provided communication that saved lives in emergencies. Don Wallace has been on the air since 1912. And Gary Legal has been building transmitters since the 1930s. I'm in Hermosa Beach, California, and I'm at the Old Radio Collector. It is a store, the only retail store in Southern California where you can buy an old radio, get one serviced, you can buy one reconditioned, you can buy an old one that you can fix up yourself. You can't believe what went through my, my mind and my heart when I discovered this store for the first time. Finally, after all these years of collecting radios, I found a store. Well, we're going to meet Jack Dempsey today, and uh, I also want to welcome you to another in our series of programs on radio collecting and restoration. My name is Mike Adams, and for the next half hour, we'll be back in time. Let's go inside and meet Jack Dempsey, the old radio collector. In the years since I taped this segment, the old radio collector store has gone out of business. Still, Jack Dempsey was a pioneer in old radio retailing, and this is how it was. I think you can hear what I was talking about earlier. That's why we like to put filters in before we even get started. That's typical of a filter home. Um, risk away all thoughts of any other sale. Only at Angelus will you find over... I wouldn't strip it and refinish it. No, I, I I'd think just it's wax it up. Can you the, replace the fabric? Or is it yeah, that's what I'm getting yeah, at. Really it, in additional to the 45, sure. it'd be about... Well, $55, barring anything unforeseen, no, should give you a good-looking radio back. I'm still in it way under what the yeah. going rate seems to be. You just don't see these much anymore. No. You used to see them at swap meets and garage sales, and uh, you don't find them very often anymore that yeah. way. And it's probably going to be in the neighborhood of three to four weeks right now. That's all right. We're not uh, depending on it for entertainment <laughs> at home, frankly. <laughs> okay, if you want to fill in the top for me. Well, actually, I got interested in old radios years before anybody else did in the fact that my grandfather was a radio repairman up until about 1960. That's what he did, is repaired radios. Well, of course, I wasn't allowed to touch a customer's radio, you know, a nice new $200 radio. So I got to work on the junk, like this one. You know, at that time, they were junk. People brought him in and said, well, here, you can have this, and I'm going to get me a new RCA. And so these were laying all over the shop, old battery sets, 
breadboards that people give a right arm for today were typically laying around. So I used to play with them, see if I could get them working again. As we get older, and meaning everybody, you want to hang on to a piece of the past. Well, most everybody that uh, is alive today grew up in the radio generation, and it becomes a distinctive part of their past, and they want to preserve a, a piece of that. Beauty. The final act of the refund. And the beast. How are you, Mike? Glad to see you here. Um, first of all, uh, the beauty I was referring to was a rather early Art Deco radio, which I've just been fortunate enough to find. And uh, we have a couple of small ones here that might interest you. This, as you know, I'm an actor and I pick stuff up all over the country wherever I go. This happens to have come from they offer free inspections and a written picture that was done in um, Iowa Fist when I was out there. I found this in a flea market. Before. Dubuque, right? Right outside of Dubuque. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh, by the way, that's Alba Francesca. Hello, hello. And I'm Jimmy Karen. Uh, can you see the, uh, is the beer bottle uh, in focus there for a minute? I can't turn this one on because this is a great favorite with children. And uh, actually, it turns on in the back here. And it, uh, you get your stations. Your station selection is up here. But the kids were here for Christmas, and they just went absolutely crazy, and they played it. So I'm afraid it has to go down to old Jack Dempsey at the old radio collector shop for a little bit of work, unless you want to uh, do some work on it while you're here. <laughs> right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't you talk about how you got into collecting radios? Um, why do you collect radios? How did you get started? He needs to. He wakes up certain mornings and there's a look in his eye and I know he's going to be searching for a radio that day. Even before I started to collect the old ones, I uh, had a yen for new radios. And we have an awful lot of those in cupboards and hiding away in various places. But there was a time when I really needed to buy, I would go so long and I had, then I had to buy a radio. <laughs> It's the search that makes it so much fun. It's like any type of collecting. It's the thrill of, of finding a treasure. That's part of why we love to travel. We combine traveling with our treasure hunts. Where do you go to find a radio? Do you Don't tell him. <laughs> Don't tell him. We go anywhere and everywhere, all over this country. If we're traveling abroad, we, we look there. By the way, the Transoceanic was one of our first antique radios, and I know exactly where we bought it. We were driving from New York to here in 1975, mm -hmm. and we found a Transoceanic radio in Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that fascinates us is that you can, that I can turn this radio on We can listen to the Metropolitan Opera broadcast today on a machine that was made 50 years ago. And I think that's kind of marvelous. I found this beautiful Atwater Kent in my cousin's basement this summer while I was on vacation and uh, it belonged to my grandfather, which was very exciting to me since he purchased it brand new back in 1932. This is a picture of my grandfather, pro and he probably purchased the radio right about the time this photograph was taken. My mother said that he bought it brand new in 1932, and about at that time it cost about $65, which was a lot of money back then. And she said that it sat in the living room in a certain spot in the corner for all those years until it ended up in my cousin's basement. They used to sit around and listen to old radio shows, and she felt it was a very good radio, that it was always their favorite. Here's a little portable I found from the 50s, a German radio. 
and transistor. A real gem, and it works. It's beautiful. Such as the Kauai Beach Boy Hotel or the Cocoa Palms Resort. Winners fly between Los Angeles and Honolulu aboard a United Airlines 747 and enjoy Royal Hawaiian. This would be what the old radio collector could take to the beach. My favorite part of radio collecting is the swap meet. And today we're on the road with Jack Dempsey and Hank Hartfield at the Long Beach Veterans Stadium. As usual, I'm looking for bargains. This one here, so whoever would buy it, first of all, it has push buttons, and I heard that with push buttons it's more valuable. Mm -hmm. And it's got a nice wooden case, and it's got both knobs. But whoever is interested is going to buy it either for the parts or he's going to buy it uh, to fix it up. It's old radio that from Jackson Bell. Uh, it's uh, missing the tubes. It's uh, a definite fixer upper. For how much? How much? Five dollars. I'll buy it from you. Sold. Uh, it's a 1926 RCA, and uh, inside it's beautiful. It's uh, I've never seen one this well preserved. Uh, considering as old as it is. Uh, look inside and see how clean it is. Tilt it for us so we can yes. Oh, beautiful blue tubes in there, too. Oh, yeah, oldies. At that time, at the time these came out, that you would have clubs, different clubs, that would uh, see just how many. They had a contest to see who could get the most stations. Yeah. Used to be WLW in Cincinnati, then KDKA in Pittsburgh, uh, KGO out here in California. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'd get together and they'd keep a log about uh, the different stations that they'd been able to get. And uh, it was something else. And it was a day two of Gene and Glenn, and uh, uh, I forget the colored, uh, the uh, blackface people, you know what I mean? Huh? Amos Nandy, yes, Amos Nandy. And there was a lot of other people would see each other in the morning and they'd say, oh my, I got this station last night, or I got the other station, maybe a thousand, fifteen hundred. 2,000 miles away, depending on conditions, so you, uh, on uh, weather conditions. It starts with the bugle blowing rapidly over your bed when you arrive. Jack, that's the G.I. Jack. It's about the same style, but the front end is, is like that. Or is that? That's not it either. This, the wood goes like that, but it's down the bottom. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. What uh, what you can do is I can I can bring the knobs down for these two here, and you can take them and try them. If they don't fit, you can bring them back. I I, I just say to people, be cautious because Hank and I have been in this business a long time, and we know the days of good buys are very slim today. Most of them of this vintage are very marginal radios. Somebody's already been in, is what you're saying, right? Yeah, or they have serious problems. Can't be restored. 20 years ago, I started picking up a radio here and there, and I brought them back here, and I sold them for around 5 or $10 a piece. And I collected radios for many, many years, and then I went into selling radios, and I found out that the Zeniths were the easiest to fix. They were the best playing radios. And uh, you could get more money out of them, and they'd sell quicker than any other kind of radio. So that's what I started doing, was collecting Zeniths. Now this is a, um, what they call an organ-style radio. It's made like an organ. It's a 1939, and um, uh, it is one of the first Zenus that they put FM on. Now this does have FM, FM on it. Okay, now these are the famous 38 radios, 1938 radios. That's when Zenith made their best radios and they made the most radios. In other words, we were coming out of a depression and they knew that there was going to be a lot of radios sold and they really made some good radios. 
this has a magic eye it also has a split dials this is a gold dial this is a blue dial for the short wave this is your motorized dial Then you fine tune it. I can get it back on that good station there. Now this magic eye shows you this is your tone button. The first amateur radio club was formed in 1909. Two years later, a high school boy named Don Wallace was on the air. As a boy in high school, I was interested in radio, of course, 1910, <coughs> and I became a high school student. 1912 and uh, of course the radio laws came in and uh, neighbor ham told me i ought to get a license so i did the uh, license was uh, nice and easy he said get a slip of paper and write i can send and receive five words a minute take it down to my dad's bank and have it notarized and uh, so i had the notary down there stamp it mailed it in that was my examination hmm. so they sent me a call in 1912 well in a couple of years I had a radio telegraph license and I wanted a ship job and got one in the summer young Don Wallace became one of the most important radio operators in history when he served President Wilson on an historic mission to Versailles in 1919 on the George Washington you want me to talk about President Wilson well the peace ship, the so-called, was uh, after World War I, and the big four went over there, the French and the English and the uh, Russian. I think that was what they were, to s determine the peace terms, the Treaty of Versailles. We pulled in there with this presidential radio. Now, the reason I was put in charge was kind of odd. Uh, I was uh, ready to be discharged at the receiving sit. Brooklyn. There was 450 operators there. I wanted to get back to school, back to college. So I was there to be discharged, and here was an officer came up to me and said, Don, you're from the West Coast. What do you know about arc transmitters? I said, there's nothing to them. Oh, you're just the man we want. We're putting a, a big arc transmitter on the George Washington, 40 kilowatt, and we can't find anybody that knows how to run it. And I said, well, there's nothing to it. Well, you pick out the 36 best operators you can and go on board and be the presidential communication system. So I uh, worked hard there. I had a couple of days, and I picked out 36 best operators out of 450. I was still a teenager. President Wilson um, used to enjoy kids. He had been president of Princeton University, and he, uh, he liked boys, so we were all boys. Uh, teenagers, uh, 20, 21, and 22. There wasn't anybody in radio who weren't young because the old people couldn't figure it out. A big part of amateur radio was building your own equipment. This is the way it was in the 1930s. Okay, I was sending about 20 words a minute there. I've been in amateur radio for 50 years, starting in 1934. Retired from Hughes Aircraft Company about uh, six years ago. After you retire, you start li reliving your early days. And one of the things I wanted to do, therefore, was uh, rebuild amateur radio as I knew it back in the 30s. And I, I often thought this was the most interesting part of amateur radio, when you built these things yourself. So I went out and uh, collected authentic parts and built things just like the ones I used to have. The first one I'd like to show is an exact replica of my very, very first uh, 
amateur radio transmitter. This is the main tuning coil of one quarter inch copper tubing and this is a Cardwell capacitor from those days which does the tuning uh, of the, to determine the frequency. And this coil, which is variable in terms of getting closer to the other one, picks off enough antenna current to uh, get up into your antenna. Your antenna is coupled from here and out. These are the binding posts which um, attach to filament and plate voltage supplies. The typical 1935, 36, or 37 station <coughs> would have this transmitter and would have what was known as a national FB7 receiver. It was uh, one of the earliest super heterodyne receivers. This one is a particularly good uh, restoration job. It's, it's almost like new and it plays like new too. So um, it's a, a nice remembrance from those times. And again, this setup, National FB7 receiver, the 47210203A transmitter, represents uh, a high spot in terms of a real fine amateur station of, let's call it, 1935. Well, this is a, this is a little uh, mobile transmitter from the 50s called a Messner signal shifter. Next week, we'll continue to look at old ham equipment at the TRW swap meet. You know, this thing really brings back memories. This is a World War II vintage Hammerlin Super Pro receiver. I had one of these when I was a kid, too. Uh, built late in the war. Um, covered uh, this particular model. Covers the AM broadcast band uh, through 20 megahertz. And... Uh, it's a typical super heterodyne design from the period. It was a very high performance receiver, uh, one of the best used during the war. Now these aren't the original knobs down here. Wayne Overbeck, who will be our guide at this most famous of radio swap meets, also talked to Don Wallace about his vintage station. What we, what we have here is a classic radio station, really, because in addition to uh, the usual things you'd see in a ham radio station, Collins S lines, kilowatt amplifiers, and all those kinds of things, we have all of these transmitters. Some of them predate World War II. Uh, we've got antenna coupling circuits, open wire fee lines to go to all the different rhombics that Don has. Uh, we've got switching, so you can switch from one rhombic to another instantly to point it in fr from one direction to another. I take it this is how you tune these, uh, That's these right. antennas. And I, all I tuned up, it. so don't touch them. I, I won't change the tuning box. <laughs> uh, and you've got link coupling, and I take it RF runs around in these open wire lines. Well, well these uh, transmitters are handy because they're broadbanded to all eight directions. I have uh, the very latest and best uh, transmitters over here. Uh, these Alpha 1 tube amplifiers are FCC approved and probably the best thing you can buy. I use these normally, but in a contest, you, uh, these aren't practical because you have to retune every, when you change direction, you've got to retune the uh -huh. reflected power. In 1940, Don Wallace purchased the Press Wireless Radio Station on Palos Verdes Peninsula, where he remains an active operator. In his 75 years on the air, he has received hundreds of awards for long-distance communication. I took public speaking in college because uh, it seemed to me that that would help you do interviews for this TV. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, we had a lot of fun with the radio. I haven't had anything but pure fun all my life. It's just been great. I just. I just can't imagine. I'm 86 now, and I've just had the time of my life. Every minute, the whole world has just been so nice. Do a little alignment on the pointer. That's probably KMPC right there. We use that a lot because it's a nice, strong station. Kind of line the pointer to 710. At that station, now we can change stations and see what the true alignment of the radio is. Usually, if you buy a working radio, you can't get in too bad of trouble. It's 
it's when you buy one and it, you don't really know what's going on with it and kind of not able to play it that you get in trouble. You find there's a lot more things wrong with it than you ever anticipated. Probably one of the biggest mistakes or biggest cons on sellers is they'll turn the radio on and show you that it plays and you'll buy it. Uh, just about any radio you can make it play. That don't mean that it's good radio. It could have a lot of problems. You can take a, particularly like in this area, you can tune in KNX on the telephone and you'll have a <laughs> be receiving a station and it can be very deceiving. So I recommend if people want to buy a radio and at all possible, get it turned on, leave it play 10 or 15 minutes and see what it does. If it's still playing, then you're pretty sure you got a good radio. Have you been to the Rose Bowl spot? Yeah, there's one. Yeah, there's one every Sunday, I guess, or every other Sunday. I haven't been there. Well, I, I, just, just, yeah, well, I am. I just haven't been there. I, I like to go to the shops, but this is actually better than the shop because you can do it all. In, this is like 100, 200 shops, you know. It's stuck out here. Yeah. Great Art Deco. This one is $20. I'll split with you. Fifteen. You got it. Totally serious. Thank you. I love it. One for you, one for me. And that's okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I like this. I put this in my bank account. What this box is here is the 1939 Rocola. It's a predecessor to a box that they call the luxury light up. Uh, the box itself is a collector's item. As somebody who's into antique jukeboxes would take this box as a collector's item. It's a rare box because you don't see too many of this style of box around. The box that's sitting next to it that's on a dolly is a model 1428 Rockola made in 1946-47. This one has been converted to play 45s. It was one of the most popular boxes that Rockola had during the what they call the golden age of jukebox. These are two of the boxes during that golden age. The age starts basically around 1938 and goes up to 1948. It's original finish. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned the year. It's uh, around 1909. What price is we talking about on these? Oh, they start anywhere from 375 on up. Yeah. This is uh, the eyeball catcher here. This is a uh, this is a Model D. Uh, it's all in quarter sawn oak, including the horn. It's a, what is referred to as a spear point horn uh, by the design in the wood itself. Uh, it's a very unusual piece. It's a 78 player, uh, and it's a little on the rare side. <laughs> Well, if you remember, about a half an hour ago, we started this week's show at the Old Radio Collector store in Hermosa Beach, and I followed Jack Dempsey, the Old Radio Collector, all the way out here to the Long Beach swap meet, where you can see uh, all of the radios in the background. But I did, there's an added bonus to this today, I did manage to find some radios, and uh, this is kind of a lesson to people who are into radio restoration. And I guess the lesson is, if you want a radio that works, that you can play, that you can get stations on that will last forever, then you need to buy it from a man like Jack, who guarantees it and works on them. But if you're like me, and you want to spend just a few dollars, you can get some junk radios. Now these are truly junk radios. I paid $10 for this one, $5 for this one actually, $10 for this one, and this one was given to me free. And I know, because of my skills in restoration, I can um, make them decent radios. But it's pretty good. I paid a total of $15 I spent here today, and I have three more radios to add to my burgeoning collection of uh, junk radios in the workshop. Next week, we're going to visit the Southern California Antique Radio Society swap meet and meeting, and um, we'll look forward to seeing you then. My name's Mike Adams. Have a good week, and happy radio collecting.
This is the TRW Ham Radio Swap Meet. It's uh, one of my favorites. And I'm Mike Adams, and I want to welcome you to the fifth and final show of the Radio Collector Series. Today, organized activities. Where to go, what books to read, what clubs to join, where to write for information, how to become a part of the radio collecting community. And also today, Bruce and I will finish the restoration on our Sears Silvertone radio that we've been working on for the past five weeks. So stay with us. This swap meet, the TRW swap meet, is, uh, is probably the largest regular ongoing ham radio swap meet on the West Coast. It attracts, as you can see, probably several thousand hams once a month. It happens on the last Saturday every month. Uh, and uh, you'll find everything from test equipment to uh, very new amateur radio gear and, as we'll see, some very, very old gear. Okay, this is a Collins uh, kilowatt um, transmitter. It's in very poor condition. The rack is about the only thing that's left out of it. But at one time, uh, this was the fundamental uh, starting point for many broadcast stations. Simply used this both on shortwave foreign broadcast and a few hams. Well healed. Uh, well, well healed hams could afford some Very high power amplitude modulation. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't thirty-two thousand dollars or something Some like that was was a, was a price uh, in the uh, early fifties for this uh, transmitter. Yeah, you could buy three houses for the price of one of these. Yeah. Here's something interesting. Well, let's do something on this G50 here. Oh, okay. Now down here, uh, one of the things that happened in in the earlier years of ham radio was there was a very close there was a very close tie between ham radio and various kinds of civil defense communications, probably more so than we have today. And the fact that these two radios are painted yellow simply means that at some point early in their history, uh, they, were, they were financed, they were purchased probably by a city, uh, by a, a city civil defense organization with federal funds. This was super technology. This was considered a uh, UHF receiver because it ran from 30 megacycles all the way to 140 megacycles. So the receiver like this was, would have been used in uh, World War II to actually listen to radar and to tell whenever enemy radar was actually uh, pulsing in your direction. So you can change course if you're on a ship or something like that. It has acorn tubes which are very unusual super miniaturized tubes that have pins coming out the side of them. An unusual characteristic of that, of that time These period. All metal tubes, um, octa types developed in the what, middle 30s well? Uh, yes, now, the, the technology of the tubes and everything we're seeing there is the middle 30s technology. Um, and like you say, pretty high quality equipment. Uh, if you could afford this in the 30s, uh, many hams actually worked two jobs in order to be able to afford to buy a receiver. Well, to buy a quality. receiver like this took a couple of months' pay. Yes. I mean, you didn't you didn't exactly go and and uh, and, and buy this uh, at a swap meet for uh, for lunch money. No. Uh, okay. okay. AM broadcast. That's the highest frequency I've range. Yeah. Okay. And then 20 and 40 are in there, right? I've got yeah. One like this. And then between the broadcast band and the old police band and yeah. Shore. Oh and that's really amazing. Yeah, get a shot of the back of the oh, rotary antenna. It peaks right there. There's a peak. You get a volume peak, and it goes down. Volume peak. So you rotate it for the maximum volume peak that you're going to get out of the receiver for maximum peak. Was the design characteristic of it? Very good bass response here. Right music there for the period. Yeah, we, we, <laughs> we got to have this on KPRZ 1150 or something. Yes. Anyway, it's gorgeous. You know, one of the things that's interesting about the TRW swap meet is you find things that you don't that you can't identify. Now, Will and I don't really know what this thing is. It's obviously World War II vintage. It must have been important uh, it, it, for some reason in, in the war. Now, it says something about video here. It talks about sync in, sync out, receiver antenna. Uh, it runs transmit antenna. Transmit antenna. It runs on 400 cycle to 2400 cycle AC. We don't know what the hell it is. 24 D volt DC input. DC input, which means it must have been used on an aircraft. 24 volts DC was the, the voltage level on, on aircraft in that period. We don't know what it is. Um, it could be radar. It could be just a receiver transmitter or some sort of data or something. 
something. It's amazing what it might be. It, it could have been. You know what I bet it was? What do you think? I bet it was either electronic countermeasures or... Uh, oh, that's a very... This is probably... That's a, probably it. This is probably it. Because it's still secret, huh? It's probably still classified <laughs> top secret. <laughs> what we're probably looking at is a piece of World War II vintage uh, jamming equipment or something. Yeah. I'll bet you. I'll yes. bet you that's what it is. Radar jamming equipment probably. Probably. Well, anyway, if you want to buy one, there it, it is. You, there it is. <laughs> Welcome to the world of plastic radios. These radios are fun radios. They're for serious collectors uh, that prefer to collect more modern radios. Uh, they are not complicated radios. They're just simple, fun radios. Uh, as an example, this Hop Along Cassidy radio up here is a child's radio. And the Charlie McCarthy radio right next to it would be a child's radio. Getting to the beginning of uh, these plastic radios, we have here a 1931 Crosley Buddy Boy, which is made out of uh, molded rep wood, they call it. And I'll show you what it looks like. In the back, it's got very thick sides. And it's very heavy, very dense material, probably some sort of wood fiber content in it. We have here a 1933 Emerson, which as you can see is considerably smaller than the Crosley that we just looked at, and much lighter. The uh, plastic is very thin and very light. This particular set has a point of interest because it has a universal plug on the back, and this set would work on 110 volts house current. It would also work on batteries. Most of these radios have five and sometimes four or six tubes in the chassis. Uh, this, this set here is a five-tube All-American five uh, Emerson chassis from a 1947 radio. It has 50L6, 35Z5s, 12SA7, 12SK7, and 12SQ7. The parts in the bottom, there's not very many of, as you can see. Some of these are called celluloids, and others are just called plastics. Exactly what the difference is, I'm not sure, but usually the celluloids will have colored veined material running through them, as you see here. Whereas the more common plastics like this actually have a very faint wood tone to the dark brown plastic. These are becoming quite valuable to collectors and antique collectors at this point. There's one thing that's pure fun is just prowling the shops hunting for that little item stuck in the shadows or covered with dust and and pulling the little treasure out and uh, and buying it for five bucks or twenty bucks and knowing it's worth much more than that but uh, it's just the, the finding is at least half of the fun, it would seem. Well, Spurgback stands for the Society to Preserve and Encourage Radio, Drama, Variety, and Comedy and it's a nonprofit organization for the public benefit. There are seven goals, and one of the major ones is to honor the uh, people from the Golden Age of Radio, the pioneers, and we have done that in, uh, by having them come to speak to us or to perform for us, as you've seen in some of the activities here at the convention, and uh, tell us about their careers and what they did and uh, what it was like to work in radio in those days. Well, I thank you for coming, Mike, and I hope you enjoy uh, the convention, and uh, I'm very proud to be president at this time. Uh, you know, I'm just riding the crest of a wave. It's just beautiful. I'm enjoying myself. When they said do a sound workshop for Spurtback, asked Dave and me to do it, it suddenly occurred to both of us that, my golly, since the period of time that we've been familiar with the organization and how great they are and what great fans they are of radio, 
I have discovered that there are many of Spurred Back members who know a good deal more about my life, my shows, and what I did, and when I did them, than I know about myself. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're illustrating these for you, and then hopefully, if we have time, we can answer some questions. But the old thing with the horses' hooves, the coconut shells, I'm sure you've all... If you don't have an old radio by now, what about a picture of one? Artist Dan Gilbert shows his work. And you can meet Jordan Young, the biographer of 40s band leader Spike Jones. I'm John Porter from Hesperia, California, and I'm a collector, restorer of antique radios. Have been since 1940. And, uh, so I just got a bunch here on display. John Porter is a legend in the radio collecting community. At one time, he had thousands of radios on display in his own museum in Northern California. So, I asked him how to become a collector. The main advice I'd give them, if they're going to be a collector, they've got to do one or two things. They've either got to be a true collector and open up the pocketbook and put the green stuff out, if they want to be it, or forget it. Uh, but this, to me, this is it. Uh, something that catches your eye, you want it in your collection, you say, how much is it? If it's for sale, you lay it out, you got the set, and you are completing the complete history of radio. This is what takes. Ours is a varied collection of everything. Uh, I don't know how many years I'm going to be around. I'm almost 75, but uh, whatever amount of time I'm around, it's going to be strictly to radio. So this will be okay then. Good morning, everyone. I'm Charles Rockman with ABC Los Angeles. Okay, now it's okay. Some of the steps I went through to get to where we are this week, uh, many steps, you saw some of them, testing the tubes, of course. Uh, I tested the voltages on the transformers and some of the resistors and some of the coils. I made sure that uh, everything was in order before I ever plugged the set in, and that's probably a good thing to remember. Never plug a radio in that you find or that someone gives you that's 25 or 30 years old because you could cause serious damage to some of the irreplaceable parts. One of those irreplaceable parts is this power transformer which between the advent of AC radios back in the 1926-27 era and about 1933 filament voltages on tubes 2.5 volts. After about 1934 the filament voltages were up to six volts and they stayed that way up into the 1950s so these old transformers 2.5 volt filaments are impossible to get what do we have here bruce what have you done on this cabinet over the past few weeks okay well first the cabinet had the woodwork done the veneer was glued down and the cross bending was glued down and then the top got re-veneered and also put a patch in here and re-veneered that mm -hmm. and then the cabinet was stripped and then the sanding and then we came back and, uh, and filled it, and then came back and uh, tinted it, and also put new boards. These are new, because the original ones, when I tried to get them off, they just, uh, they split lengthwise, and they were real thin, like they were almost machine too thin. And these are identical then to the Real original. close, yeah. real close. And, uh, and then after it was tinted, uh, then I put the, put the, uh, the gloss on. Mm -hmm. And also a new grill cloth, and you also, uh, well, it looks like you hand detailed the escutcheon there with the black inside and the silver tone logo on the outside. That's original, too, and that's beautiful. Yeah, right. And, and also hand painted the, the black in here. I forgot to mention that. Yeah. Oh, that's right. You did, didn't you? And that way it looks real, real close to original because they were all originally a real dark brown, mm -hmm. or the more expensive sets were, were always done in black. Okay. So I always try to have things that are real close to original when they go back in as far as length and uh, but even then even, even then you get an occasional surprise okay I'll, I'll look to make sure it's uh, not well, you probably know it's not going to come to the front of this right well it's always good to, to, to eyeball a, a, as it goes in uh, generally on an older set like this the speaker boards are made very well and, and you have very little problems on some of the newer sets uh, 
uh, the, especially the little tail models, you get a surprise in there because it's, it's all not as heavy, quite as heavy as wood. Um, let's put the chassis in now. Can we do that from this angle right here? Or? Mm -hmm, sure. Hello. Uh, on an earlier set, some of the uh, volume controls and tone controls are isolated from the chassis, mm -hmm. and it's, and you can get about 250 plus across them if you uh, touch them. So that and he means volts. So. Yeah, that always uh, yeah. that that makes you jump and. Yeah. Let's, uh, let me turn this on here. The, on the other side, I think. And I'm here. oh, okay, you're right. Okay, I turned it on. It's just, and it did light up, which is a good sign. The problem with this, of course, the problem will be you have to let it warm up. Sometimes it takes a week. <laughs> people always make fun of my radios because they always take so long to warm up. Do they? People joke with you about that sort of thing. Yeah, it, sh it should take o over 30 seconds, but. See? That sounds good. What I thought I would do now is take this back to Hollywood up on Western Avenue to um, the Home Decorator Thrift Shop because I bought it from him for $35. Now, what do you think? That's superb. Yeah. Do you remember what that looked like? <laughs> I wish you could have seen this thing. It was, it was, it was yeah. a piece of junk. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I paid, what, $35 yeah. for it, right? And I spent $100 getting the cabinet restored. See, it's clean inside, too. Beautiful. Well, we talked about this being a good buy for restoration because everything is here. The uh, escutcheon was here and the original dial, things you can't replace. This is a thrill. It really and truly is. I, uh, I enjoy caressing a woman. Mm -hmm. I get to somewhat the same satisfaction as seeing something beat up and coming back into a beautiful uh, piece again. Go ahead and caress them if you like. No, not, that's not my type. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is one of our quarterly antique radio swap meets. We've got a little bit of everything here today. Battery sets, AC sets, parts, magazines. SCARS is an organization that's been founded some 10, 8 to 10 years now. We uh, meet four times a year. We're having a business meeting today after the swap meet. We'll talk about some of the club business. Our dues are $10 a year, and that entitles uh, a member to a four journals for the year and an opportunity to come and meet others and share in the collecting and restoration of radio sets. Uh, a man came over one day with two radios and uh, he wanted five dollars a piece for them and I bought them and in about two or three years I had about 150 radios. That's how I got. You get started that way. You get one or two and and you can't stop, but I've kind of slimmed the collection down now, and I have mostly Marconi and DeForest. And for everybody uh, to can see what I've collected, yeah. and I have uh, one for every uh, variable tuning condenser uh, panel, another panel for every uh, rheostat. I think I have 40 different types of rheostats. Authentic facts. Fakes. Oh, fakes. Well, I spell it that way so people get confused, see? Yeah. That's what that means there. They're, they're, all these are, are fakes. This is a, this is an authentic fake. Really? Yes. It looks real. Sure it does. It looks like it belongs to something. That water Kent part, and this is a that water Kent part. It goes on a breadboard. You made it, huh? Right? Oh, yeah. I make uh, all this stuff. Eight, uh, 13. Give yep. me 12. You can... Oh, I'll take this one. Yeah. Ten, took, oh. Okay, give me all the right. ten bucks. <laughs> the little haggle. <laughs> you, got, you got change? Yeah, what do you need change for? Okay. Ooh, I hope they're all working. They've all been tested and they're working. If I don't have a have them tested, there's no label on the bottom. All right, thank you. Now this one that I just collected it came from the 1930s and it's uh, very rare. Of course, something like this is uh, used in broadcast transmitters these days, too. But uh, we have a lot of fun, you know, just uh, collecting them and uh, uh, selling them, too. I just got rid of a 
quite a few that some other guy wanted, but I was really happy to get this one because it's really a rare tube. And this came from World War II, uh, used in Navy transmitters, and uh, probably cost the government a uh, hundred bucks, and we get about three dollars for them now. <laughs> uh, these are uh, amplifier-only tubes made uh, primarily for Western Electric amplifiers of the early, very early 20s, 1920 uh, through 1924, well, say. And there are several models of Western Electric amplifiers that use these tubes. Most of them have the tubes showing right outside on the panel, you know, not behind a lid or anything like that, but showing right on the outside. And it's, a, I think, a very attractive tube. <laughs> Oh, what is that set there, may I ask? That's a helicopter. Oh, is it? You wanted 10 here, didn't you? Yeah. And ten, how, how, five, much, yeah. how much is it? Let's see, there's your 10, and there's your 5. Thank you. Now, how much is that? $5. Set? That's for this thing. Okay. How much is it? You know them collectors are crazy? You know, yeah, look at them jump on your truck. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're looking for all kinds That's, of goodies. Guy over there interested in your stuff. Oh my god, right? That's kind of good. So, this? How much is this? I was asking five of these and a dollar a piece for these. Okay, most of this stuff is all Bakelite cabinets. Uh, they range from, oh, mid 1940s to through the 50s. And uh, the radios in the back with the little flip tops are zeniths. And, uh, Actually, the, the tubes inside are worth more than the radios themselves. And try to replace the tubes, why it would cost you quite a bit more. Favorite here? Well, I don't have my favorite here. These are the ones I'm trying to sell. <laughs> my favorites are at home. Primarily the Zenith Transoceanic uh, shortwave sets. Okay, right here I've got a Feta radio. It's quite popular with the Art Deco collectors. It's made in the 30s. And you can see it's a little handle. And the design's quite nice. And, uh, and also I collect novelty radios, a little birdhouse or schoolhouse radio. And then, of course, this one here in the late 40s, early 50s. Now, I always say something about radios. R radios are like people. They all have different faces, but they all do the same thing. Well, the prices on the very early one is $95, and uh, the early one's 50 40, 40, and 40. So the prices uh, on TVs really haven't uh, gone up. They're going to, though. Yeah, but they're going to. The history of the television goes back more than 60 years. And like radio, it is a fascinating story with inventors, investors, and creative people. I'll look at the television in a future series. There have been several changes since I bought that first junk radio to restore. The home decorator thrift shop is now a travel agency. The old radio collector store is gone. Economic reality in the antique radio business. And Don Wallace, a true radio pioneer, died at age 86 in May 1985. Ours was the final interview. So now you want to join the radio collecting community. In a minute, I'll give you an address where you can write for information. The thing that really makes radio collecting enjoyable is to know what you're doing. Uh, most of us started out hit or miss, uh, just knowing, yeah, we liked old radios. There are now a, a number of resources available. There are, there are books available. There are clubs. Uh, let me just run through several of these. Uh, vintage Radio itself is a book of the earlier days, taking it from, from 1865, really, up through 1929. Then we have a flick of the switch, which takes it from 1930 to 1950, which is pretty much, as of today, the, the end of the collectibles era. There are reprints now of this. This happens to be an original of a book called Radio Enters the Home, which is a very good book that was put out by RCA in, I believe, 1922. Uh, tells all about the, the neat old sets. The, there there are, are uh, other books. There's a, a, a copy of a thing called Gernsback's 1927 Radio Encyclopedia, which is, is excellent because it, sees, it shows the world 
as people saw it then, which, by the way, is different than now. When you live in an era, it's a great hodgepodge, and there's a lot of hodgepodge in here. It takes some years to, to strip things down to who are the real heroes, uh, what is it that really happened. The dynamic thing is the radio club itself, and there are radio clubs in many areas now. The best way to find out about where these clubs are uh, is is to write to someone who knows which oddly enough is vintage radio they'll be pleased to fill you in and you'll you'll, <laughs> you'll probably get more things than you can read radio grabbed me as a little kid i built a crystal set when i was about nine years old uh the the sheer the sheer wonder of communicating through space of somebody way over there miles away being able to 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 talk into a microphone or tap a key and here it comes into me and we're, we're, we're communicating, uh, to me was a, was a source of tremendous wonder. This is the final show in the Radio Collector series. My intention was to present a brief history of the invention of radio devices as told by radio hobbyists and radio collectors. I want to thank the Southern California Antique Radio Society and President Floyd Paul for giving me access to the radio collecting community. I want to thank author and historian Morgan McMahon for his historical perspective on radio collecting. I want to thank Robert Jensen and Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters for a behind-the-scenes look at the golden age of radio programming. I also want to thank Bruce Westaby for giving me unlimited access to his radio restoration and repair facility. And I especially want to thank the faculty, the staff, and the students of the Department of Communications of California State University, Fullerton for their support. Thank you very much for watching. is now adjourned and we're going to let Ralph Clark at the conclusion of our meeting which is now tell about our contest and the awardees. I'm going to ask uh, each of the winners though to uh, if they will to tell us a little bit about their entry. Now this is a little form of show and tell. Uh, we'll start with the battery sets. We had five entries.